Okay, good morning everyone. Um, just to let you know, I'm just going to put a disclaimer on the screen now, so if everyone can just read that. This event will be recorded um, and it will go straight to YouTube Live as well, so if you'd like to not be recorded... Um, so, hi everybody. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, today is day one of Fashion Revolution Week and this is the fourth year of Fashion Open Studio. Um, which is an initiative uh, run by Fashion Revolution, uh, which aims to put the spotlight on the designers pushing the conversations around sustainability forwards. Uh, this is the first time that we've done this digitally, so you might have to slightly bear with us, uh, but uh, it should be all fine. Uh, we have 68 events this week uh, from 50 designers, around 12 countries around the world. So we've been uh, doing a lot of logistics um, in the run up to this. Um, <clears throat> today's our denim day to open the week and we have Mawson Sajid uh, kicking off, uh, who's about to enlighten us with a little history and a tour of his studio in West Sussex. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Morsin because he has a lot to tell you and hope you enjoy uh, the day and the week um, and if you have any questions or comments just pop them in the chat and we'll keep an eye on them. Uh, thanks a lot, enjoy. Over to you Morsin. Hi guys. Hello, 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 every, every, everybody. Um, my name is Morsin. I'm a denim like designer, and I've been a denim designer for nearly 20 years. And I'm going to give you a little tour of my studio and a little denim his history lecture as well. Any any questions um, throughout the hour long session? Obviously, put them on the chat. It should be on your on, on your right. Um, if there's anything else, I'll try and I'll try and look at it like throughout the actual session. If not. 10, 15 minutes near, near the end, I'll do a little Q&A slash chat, chat, so it'll be quite fun. Anyway, um, so first of all, let's show you, show you my studio. So basically, I, I used to have a really um, big studio in White, Whitechapel, but now I'm based in, in like West Sussex, so I've got a little denim room and it's quite insane. I've got more than a thousand vintage samples here, because there was a crazy archive books as well. And, and then, I've collected a lot of like machines as well. I don't know if you can actually see. I've, I've um, this particular, this first one's a darn, a, a, a like darning machine, which is amazing. So it's a Singer 47W70. The next one's a Union Special 43200G. This one's the Rolls Royce or the the the, the creme de la creme of like of a uh, hemming like he, hemming machines. But let me go downstairs as well. I've got a crazy. The whole house is actually denim denim fired. It's quite nuts. So we used to have a showroom. But we decided to up our game and actually come down here. And that's right now. I've got a staircase full of um, old denim banners as well. So my wife's wife, wife, like, sort of sort of side here. So we um, do a lot of sampling. And we have a lot of um, people coming to our studio. A lot of designers come come to us as well. Uh, this is my other room as well, which is quite nuts. We're building a big studio. Um, outside as well this is i've got i've got more than 25 like vintage like sort of sort of like machines and you you learn more about becoming a better designer when you understand it's quite a lot a lot of them are super duper rare from this one here is a a, 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 a like sort of like triple needle it does like a three sixteenth and you know what that what, what like that is and i've learned um everything in inches now obviously i'm i'm a, I'm a british trained like designer but um you can't be a good denim designer if you don't know your inches. That's a little thing. So let me show you a few samples. And if my wife's side can help me. Let me see if we can put this down here. We can redirect. So you can see. See. Okay. So this particular one here, I don't know if you can see it. I'm in the shadow, I think. So this one here is one of the earliest like Levi's garments. It's from 1873. It's a rep reproduction from like sort of like Levi's. And what's amazing about it is it's only got one pocket, hasn't got belt, hasn't got belt loops yet. And it's single needle, needle tail, needle tail loop. It's got a curved waistband, which is unbelievable. And this is actually the one that started it all. So this is actually the one that had the first like rivet. And I'll do a little, a little tour of the actual garment it's sort of like in a bit. An amazing thing, thing is, you know, it, it 
it morphed as well. So all of these garments, oh, it's all very, very dark. This is actually one from the, from the 20s now. And what's amazing, this is actually the one where, this is just before the belt loop. So in like the, in like the, twi in, in like the 20s, and pretty much things haven't changed since this point here, which is quite, quite amazing. So from the, from the, from the, from the only thing that's changed is, is that we've lost our cinch and it added, added belt loops. And you know, the fit and everything has changed as well, but pretty much this is the actual foundation for all the, all, all the jeans that we all wear now. But it all started in 1873 when Levi Strauss and Jacob, Jacob, Jacob Davis came up with this actual pair here, which is really, really fun. Go. Early jeans, which you guys might know, might might know, you might not know, were actually made out of duck canvas. So they weren't actually blue. They were kind of this kind of green color, which is quite fun. And, and also cotton as well is really interesting because it wasn't, wasn't always white. So the early, early, early cottons that people used were actually slightly colored as well. So hence why it was a duck, duck canvas, which is really fun. Brown, excuse me, brown. It's me and my color, color blindness. Um, What's superb is, once you learn, oh, I'm sorry the screen's going dark a lot. If you break in your own pair, you can learn so much about how things or things are washed. And that's what, what I actually do. I actually buy a lot of dirt, dirty jeans. I actually break down and I learn a lot from the pairs that I actually wear. And then what I do is I go to like factories and we make whisker patterns and laser, laser patterns. So a lot of the garments that you might buy they probably started from an original, from, from like an original pair, which is really, really fun. So I do a lot of this work where I've got literally hundreds of these now, which is really, really fun. And if you can lift up the laptop side, mm -hmm. let me show you something there. Um, thank you very much. So in the dark here, there, put it down there. This is cool. In like, so England, we actually have our own jeans. So our, our jeans were made in like, in like, sort of in like the war. Maybe we stand over there. Okay. Okay. So bright. Having having the first the first like first like first like session is really fun. In like the UK, we actually had, had our own jeans. They were actually green. So and these are also amazing too. If you can see. Yeah. No, that's all mm -hmm. good. This, 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 like, this like, particular one's from like, the film like the 40s, which is really, really fun. And it's amazing because it's actually, it's actually made, made, in, made in England in like Derby. But the great thing is it's salvage as well. And most things from this period were, which is really fun. And this like, particular one's been, like, this particular garment's been referenced quite a, quite, quite a lot. Really good, really good. And then what's amazing also, this early period of actually, of actually jeans, there was a lot of really amazing brands that were doing really clever like stitching and, and also hiding things inside the waist, waistband as well. Lots of single needle ta tailored, ta tailored details where the, where the waistband's like really small. A mix, mixture of single needle felt and chain, 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 chain stitch felt too. Quite remarkable. So anyway, so... It's quite amazing. So this particular room, obviously, is where I make a lot of my own samples for my clients, and also we 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 actually develop quite a lot of things here too. And I've got a lot of research in this room as well. But you can't you learn a lot. You learn a lot from actually buying lots of vintage garments, and that's what's quite amazing. So I'm going to go back upstairs now, and I'll start my little denim history tour. Do it this way so you guys can actually see the room. There you go. And you can't be a denim designer without having denim banners. And this is really, really fun. And my, one of my friends in Amsterdam, Jason Light Denham, heavily, heavily inspired by that dude. He's got lots, lots of amazing, amazing banners as well. So now I'm going to do a screen share. Hopefully it's going to work. Don't follow the running programs, background running programs. Only keep the video. Okay, hopefully you guys can all see this. So, let's go through it. So this is me, me of course. Thank, thank, thank you, thank, thank, thank you very much, and welcome, well, welcome. That's my wife, my wife, my wife as well. 
Denim's really fascinating because it really did, really, really did start with the actual rivet. Now, obviously, workwear and people have been wearing workwear garments for like millennia, but actually, it, it really isn't. It's a really stupid tagline. It really, really is a like, riveting story. And it li literally starts with these, the, with, like, with like these two chaps, Levi Strauss and Jacob Davis. Now, no, no one seems to remember Jacob, poor old Jacob Davis, but he's the one who actually came up with the actual rivet. And this was like a, 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 a like tailor. And he was basically, he, he was a tailor and he basically, he basically made garments for everyone, including a lot, a lot of miners, which is really, really fun. And basically he had the idea of actually riveting garments like together because he noticed a lot of the people that he made garments for, they were falling apart. So he was just a normal tailor, but he was actually thrown into the, into the world. And basically one of his suppliers was Levi Strauss and Levi Strauss and company, um, they basically were, they were basically a dry goods, com dry goods company. So a bit like if you go to a camping shop now, you buy everything from the tents from the ropes to everything that you would need to go out camping or, or something like that. But he was basically, basically, basically like supplying all of the guys in like the gold rush period. And Jacob Davis had the idea of, patent, of patenting the rivet, but he didn't have enough money. So he went to Levi Strauss and Levi Strauss went halves or halves with him, which is really, really fun. And this is actually a picture of that original patent, which is really fun. And this is actually the actual garment that I, that I, that I, that I, that I just showed a few minutes ago. And what's amazing about it is they actually put the date of the patent on the actual, on, on the actual rivet. So it was May 20th, 1873. And they had the patent for about a 20 year period up until about, you know, up nearly about 1880 or something. So like, 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 like that. So no other company could use rivets for this small, small period. So what's amazing is a lot of brands are actually coming up with amazing things during this period as to, to counter it. And everyone always talks about how denim's amazing, like the golden era is from the fifties and like sixties. I honestly don't believe so. I actually think it's the magic period is from 1870 to about 19, 1920. Because after that, it all becomes commercialized. A bit like that gene that I showed you from the 20s. That's pretty much the carbon footprint of every single gene that we all wear like, wear like today. So these are actually a set of miners and they actually are actually wearing like, wearing, 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 wearing like Levi's jeans, which is quite amazing. And this is actually a very early, exa early example from, um, from the Harris collection. So there's an amazing guy called Michael Allen, Allen Harris. He's a denim, denim ar archivist and like historian. And he's written a couple, of, a couple of books together with his wife. But he documents a lot of garments and he goes down mines finding them. And he's actually found a lot of amazing things that even Levi's and those guys didn't even know existed. So there's quite a lot. And the reason is, I think it was 1904, it could have been, there was, or there was a massive earthquake in like San Fran and Le Levi's lost their entire archive. So a um, bit like G-Star now and modern, even I do it myself, my own, my own, my own brand. Um, I make something and I, I, keep a, I keep a copy of it or I keep a, re a reference of it. Levi's did the same thing. And those poor guys, they, um, they basically lost all of their heritage. They lost basically, they even, they, they still don't know what the arcuate, the back pocket detail actually comes from. It could be, it could be from an eagle, it could be from the bridge, they don't really know. So they lot of, lost a lot of like, detail. So in about 1990-ish, uh, Levi's actually hired a lay lady called Lynn Downey and her job was to go and find a lot of the missing pieces for their archives. So now they've got a superb archive and they re recreate a lot of garments as well. But this is one of the early, early examples. And if you notice very, very carefully, it's only got one back pocket. It's got a cinch back, has, hasn't, got belt, hasn't, got belt, hasn't got belt loops yet. The coin pocket um, is actually the fourth pocket that's actually on top of the waistband. So the, you know, the reason that it's actually got one back pocket is most people were right-handed, which is quite amazing. So this is actually a piece that he found down on mine. And what's amazing is, so after the whole gold rush period, period denim itself, uh, a lot of there was, and now at this point, there's a lot of other denim brands that are on the scene. And you must understand, denim, it wasn't just, you know, everyone thinks it's of like Levi's the whole time. There was like literally 20 other amazing denim brands. Every, you know, so it was like, you know, um, as Carhartt was like sort of like one of them. Um, you know, it, it was, it was, it was like Boss of the Road, it was Can't Bust Them. There were so many brands, and a lot of them, a bit like tech companies now, they all went bust. It was mainly it was roughly during this period, the cowboy area period, really. And basically what it was, so a bit like tech companies now, 
all the other companies bought out all of the patents. So Lee and Wrangler and VF, they own a lot of these, a lot of these old, older brands. They don't do anything, any, anything with them, which is quite, quite sad. But it's just so, but there's a lot of denim brands that existed, but they no longer exist. But after this gold rush period, the Cowboys were the first to adopt jeans. And basically what it was, and what basically what, what it was, um, they were the first to uh, adopt it because denim at this period from the 20s and, 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 like, and like 30s was pretty much work wear. You wouldn't be caught, you wouldn't be wearing denim like it is now. It wasn't a fashion garment. And it was only, you know, it literally was for miners, cowboys, fashion music. It's li li literally that famous phrase where it was actually through celebritism and early, early sort of celebritism and also sort of like, sort of, sort of the whole like, uh, rebellious youth really, really. So it was actually a lot of film guys and a lot of people were seeing jeans on, on all the people that, 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 they, that they liked. And it basically became extremely popular o over a short, Sort of like period, and especially 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 like sort of like celebrities from like that sort of sort of, sort of like Marion Monroe, James 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 Dean, but then that's when it became really really cool. But then also there's a lot that lot that's happened in that period where you know then you get the whole designer denim period in like this in in, in like in like seventies and eighties, and that's when things changed quite like considerably. Even the way how we make jeans, how we spin cotton. That's why denim from this period in the 80s looks completely different from even like this the 60s 60s period and i'll go into go into that now and then we get to the, to the whole like denim like sort of sort of sort of like renaissance this is kind of the period that we're in now where you've got denim designers like myself who were like 20 years in who know a lot about the past who collected a lot of vintage garments but now we're we're, we're basically learning more about the past trying to recreate that old spirit again even looking at the sbis the stitch per inches and trying to do something really quite amazing but also looking at the fits as well and refinding a way how we spin cotton as well back in the old way of making it but then we can't talk about anything without talking about cotton so cotton's quite amazing like even the the t-shirts that we wear it's pretty much the same process of how cotton is actually spun and how cotton has been spun has been the main thing that's changed quite like quite like considerably including including that actual loom loom that actual loom loom uh, looms as well and you know, there's so many like machines and processes involved with spinning that can change the outlook of the actual the actual fabric. Even I met someone who's got really old carding machines as one of the, one of the earlier processes of when you when you actually start um, spinning cotton when you when you, when you well, from the actual bale itself. And this carding phase is super important. Every single process is like it's like a dial in when you're making music. All the different all the, all the different levels you can change literally how the fabric looks from every single process that that you do and i'm not going to go into the entire like sort of process but cotton itself you know up until the 60s and uh, up until the 60s you know if you find any vintage garments you'll see that the cotton is a lot more slubby it's got it's got debris in it it's got bits in it and and what it is this is actually a chart that i took in like the low like textile museum when i was in 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 like in in like in like the us and if you notice, it, it's really it's really quite dirty and it's got lots of debris in it. And then up until the end, it gets super do 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 for white. We were actually processing cotton near somewhere like near some near somewhere like the middle. And also all of these processes that I just showed you, all of them were done by hand as well. So if you ever come across any vintage garments pre the 1940s, those oh. garments were actually done by literally manual labor. Even I tried to lift up a bale of of cotton, and I only lifted it like one inch like off the floor. It's crazy the processes but then nowadays like lots of um lots of denim designers and buyers and people who have got some kind of power it's very important to know that you know we need to make sure that when we buy our cotton we're making sure it's bci it's just there's so cotton is really it's like a murky world as well there's lots of um dodgy agreements there's loads of people growing cotton some of it's not like regulated um there's a lot of this really really Hi. terrible laptop so charger it's really important that when we look at cotton, we need to make sure that it's for me. Better. So this, the actual the, the, B, the, the BCI sort of like initiative is really important because they actually go around all of the main ginners around round round around the world. They educate them. They make sure they're not wasting 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 water. And cotton is a very thirsty plant. Also, denim itself. There's um ev nearly every single process that makes a pair of jeans isn't really good. So you know, in the last 20, 30 years, there's been a lot of a lot of push to try and make the process all the processes a lot a lot more a lot more greener so when it comes to cotton we need to make sure that we're using BC, bci or at least organic like cotton now this is one of the probably the most important slides i might be might be showing it might be quite boring but actually it's very very quite made hopefully you guys get it 
So all of those processes that I showed you, all, all of those like machines, there's actually two different ways. You might have heard of a, a type of cotton called ring ring or ring spun cotton. Whenever you see any denim heads, they go, oh, it has to be ring ring. They're talking about how it's been spun. So this slide here, if you see on the right here, there's two different kinds of cotton. There's, there's many more, but actually ring spun is the old way. So it's a lot more slubbier. If you notice, it's like all the fibers are going up the yarn. It's a bit like when you grab hair and you try and, pu try and pull it. Um, it's very, very strong. But the open end that was invented in like the 70s and 80s, that was a result of actually them having bigger looms and they wanted to make things more faster. So they tried to make a more uniform yarn. This yarn is a lot more weaker because it's going around it, so you can actually snap it. So that's why when you get jeans from the 80s, you know, they're not that hard wearing. You know, you sit on the floor, you're doing any manual work, you get massive holes in it, it starts like ripping, all because it's open end. And if you go to the slide a little bit on the left here, you, or, or sorry, on, on the right in the middle, open end, the process of spinning, is a lot more cheaper. You don't need much of those big like sort of machines to the point where you can save millions of pounds by having an open end factory rather than a ring spun factory. Anyway, a bit boring, but very, very, very important. Now, um, this is a slide uh, for Michael Allen Harris. Now, cotton itself has changed quite considerably, a bit like our food, we like genetically mo modify it. So this is a picture of a gene from 9, 1910. It's pretty much impossible now to recreate this gene yes you can engineer the fabric you can sit on amazing loom you get you get, you get fabric technicians who will, will try and spin it in the old way as possible but it's all because the cotton has been genetic, it's been like genetically modified so much it's very hard to get to that older strain so there's a lot of uh, work going on that we do and i do where we're trying to find older strains to try and work with so it's quite fun um now Weaves. Now, denim itself is a three by one right hand twill. Hopefully, you, some of you might know well know that. If you don't know that, basically what it is, it's um, it's going to be it's denim is made of warp and warp and weft, and the weft part is white, it's where the where the bobbin or the shut or the shuttle is. And basically, if you look here, let's go to the one. It should be yeah. If you go to in the middle, there's on in the middle on the right, there's a picture that shows you there's three and then there's ones. So that's how you get the twill line. And early early jeans. Up until the 1930s were all two by one so they were much more lighter like and lighter like construction and one of the reasons they did this weird construction is because it is basically basically to save money so they figured out a way of having indigo on only only seven set on like 70 70 percent of the actual fabric and they didn't want then had they had the white weft so basically your legs don't go as blue as, as they should as they should do so it's mainly just being really clever clever engineering so our denim is a three by one right hand twirl, which is right, right in the middle on, on, on the left, probably 95% of denim um, is actually like that. Now, you can't talk about many mills. Obviously, we've got Isco who are, who are here, and Isco are unbelievable, one of the more, most um, forward think, thinking denim mills, in, in, especially in like, Turkey. They, they, they're like humongous, but we can't talk about denim production without talking about cone mills. They were one of the earliest founders. Half of the Half of the technologies that we use now in the denim world were invented by these guys. And their white oak mill closed a few, few, few years ago. And they were, you know, I think like 40 or 50 salvage looms left in like America. Very, very sad. But anyway, so talking about patterns as well, pattern and identity is really amazing. Like up until, up until the 18, 1800s, everything was patterns. And this is actually one of the oldest garments that they found is it was on like a mummy. And it was a pattern jacquard, which is quite amazing. So there's lots of evidence of, of pattern, and it's going going this way, way kind of like again. But in the denim world, there's mainly three or four different type patterns that we mainly use. We use a right right hand twirl, we use a left left hand twirl, and most people might might recognise a zigzag pattern of a broken twirl or or a herringbone. Really, they're the ones that we use. But there's many, many more, many, many more. And also, you can see a picture here of an actual. Um, one fiber that that's been cut and you can see how much of the indigo has been actually pen 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 penetrated is that's actually the ring dyeing method of when you when you dye yarn as well so that's how that's the reason why jeans fade is because the core of the yarn is still white and they did that also to save money so what they do is a, it's in a massive machine that's the size of my house and it goes in all the all the all the yarns get dipped and they come back out again and they dry them and they dip them and they dry them and they dip them and dry them and, and most denims dip probably nine ten ten times in like japan they dip it more than 20 times so it's quite quite aggressive so yeah but anything goes now and it's a really it's a really amazing moment if any of you go to any kind of trade shows or you see really quite advanced fashion brands some of them are slowly going away from the right hand wheel going 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 a lot more 
adventurous from needle punching to really slobby effects to to literally ha hand loom effects 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 as, as well but denim itself is, is made in many 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 countries and it's mostly made in in like countries that have free trade or trade agreements this is a quite a, a quite a crazy thing i'm going to say but you know in if you go to like sort of wikipedia it's like china india turkey pakistan and the bangladesh they're, they're the biggest producers of denim yes that's true but some of the best denim is actually made in like japan uh, italy it, it, italy as well some of the smaller countries but i'm not saying none of these countries don't make great denim you get amazing denim from turkey you get amazing denim from pakistan you get amazing denim in china it's all about the designers the engineers and they can all do it but obviously these five countries at the top they have agreements with european nations and you know that's why you know the moment um you know the likes of the likes of arcadia and that they're only going to pakistan and bangladesh because they have we have three free trade agreements right right now the moment that changes will be good they'll, they'll be going like somewhere else so that's one of one of the sad 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 things about sad things about it this is a picture of a vintage shuttle loom so the one on the bottom bottom left i took it i didn't steal it from the the internet and what's amazing about it is obviously if, up until the up until the 70s everything was like salvage and salvage is just the old way of making like fabrics it was really narrow roughly less than a, a meter wide so you needed a lot of fabric about three meters to make a pair of pair of pair of jeans and up until so up until the 70s you know people were still using these old looms and they're very difficult to use if you look even if you look at the picture from cone mills there literally was a person um a t like a technician or worker on every other machine if you go to any major fa factory now there might be only a couple of people for every every maybe you know not uh, there's hot, not 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 that many workers working in like for factories now a lot a lot a lot, lot more things are automated these machines here you needed someone to always load load up the bobbin every literally every 10 or like 15 minutes so that's why they were there to load up all the shuttles and yeah it's quite remarkable and these fabrics were amazing because they had lots of slubby effects they had lots of imperfections and when it came to the 70s and they started to you know all these factories were getting quite old and they're like, okay we're gonna we're gonna buy a, a new set of looms then they said you know what let's go a loom that's more wider we can make more fabric fa fabric from it and that was a result of the whole op the whole open end thing so that's what happened there so a, a, a way of advancement actually made denim a lot more weaker it lost a lot of its car lost, lost lost a lot of its characteristics and as our Jap our japanese friends were they were the ones that actually went and basically refound denim again and, and educated the world really and then up where we were all using our, des or our designer designer denims and open-end fabrics which we didn't care about is actually our japanese friends that went and converted their old kimono looms and they started making selfish denim de denim again it's only until the mid 90s where people started realizing wow this denim from japan is amazing oh wow it's made on sell sell selfish selfish looms so quite a, a fascinating fascinating story there's another other, another picture as well from cone so yeah, briefly touched on it as well. So you can easily find out if a, if a, if a denim garment's salvaged by just checking on on like the inside the inside of it. So the quick, quick the quickest way is to check the side seam. The side seams are normally straight, and if it's got salvage, it's most likely done on a vintage vintage loom. You can 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 get modern looms from the eighties as well, like piccolo looms, which are more than more than fine. But most of the time, you find overlocking. I said, that's it. Yeah, that's that, that's an indication. It doesn't mean it's not good, good, good denim. There's amazing denims that are made on these newer looms as well. And this is a brief little glimpse of lay plans. I mean, some of you might have still seen them before, but a few any kind of selvage selvage fabric, most of the time you'll need about three meters or so for a selvage pan. If you've got a non selvage so one that's one fifty wide, you can get away with like one one point two. But you can also slip in some other things as well, and that's what a lot of um, fast fashion brands do. They mix other styles in other fits they try and maximize and like so tight the actual lay lay plan but what's quite alarming is and now you might in a lot of uh, denim brands do it i'm not going to name any name I, I might do if i get pushed they use a lot of fake selvage so this is actually done on a modern loom and it's called a tuck-in selvage and actually kind of splice it you can there's a little there's a splice about one centimeter away from the side a lot of brands i'm going to name them now top shop arcadia jack jones you name it they all they all do it they all use this and they say it's done on a vintage on a vintage on a vintage loom it's not it's completely fake anyway so denim weights as well um you get much more heavier weights of course on light weights back in the day everyone always thinks that it was really heavy it wasn't up until the 50s it was more up to about 10 or 12 ounce 
and now now that's considered a, like a medium weight 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 now um, and but now nowadays is the heaviest weight denim that's been produced so far is a 40 ounce that, that naked and famous have done they've got the world record i did a 38 ounce a few a few years ago i had had the record for maybe a month which is really funny but i know, I know carabo mills in like japan have made it at 50 it's like a, a race to the heaviest it's really quite alarming to be honest personally anything over over 18 is is like if you're planning to have kids don't even try it so it's pretty funny so we just touched on this guy his name is michael allen harris an amazing denim like historian you can find him on he's got he's got an amazing blog as well but you can find by his books he's got two books out or three books i believe um this is this one you can find on amazon well worth buying he finds old garments finds the old finds the old patents unbelievable and this is actually one of the jackets that he he actually found so this is a triple pleated blouse from 1874 and it's remarkable because these are earlier garments they're tailored it's it's really considered it's got tiny stitching SBIs, the pleats are really amazing. You know, many people didn't even know, didn't even knew that this garment even like existed until he found it. Obviously, there's records, but not the actual physical garment. Now Levi's actually own this particular sort of like particular one. They re, they recreated it for their archive, which they all they always do. So all they you know this is a re, re like a, like a one to one like recreation. And um yeah, Miles Miles is Johnson, a good friend friend of ours. He worked at Levi's at the time. He's he's one of one of the ones who actually I've actually this was really fun. This is actually the Type 1. It's a very famous jacket. It's one of the earliest trucker sort of jackets. This is the one that everyone thought it actually began with. It didn't. It began a lot more earlier with like sort of like this one here. And then we get the Type 2. This one's quite interesting because the differences between the Type 1 and Type 2 aren't that major. It's the fit as well. See, the Type 1's got one pocket, slightly more boxy. It's got cinch, cinch, cinch back. The Type 2 has no longer a cinch. It's got, actually got side, side adjusters on it. It's got two pockets. It's a little bit more fitted now. But the interesting thing is, even in the 50s period, you know, Levi's and these other companies, it's all about making money. It's, it's all about you know, mass market. You know, the reason they added these side, side adjusters, and I learned this when I was as a younger, younger, younger designer, is really just, you know, if you put side adjusters on a garment, you can class it as, 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 as like a shirt. So for duty rates, you can ship it much, more, much more cheaper. So they were already thinking about that. This is a type three, which everyone, this is one that I kind of like grew up with. It's got the, um, it's got the pleats down, down the middle. It's a lot more, more, a lot more fitted. If you notice this particular one skewed, slight, skewed slightly, that's all because how it's, the cotton's been spun, actually. That's why, that's why things skew. That's just quite fun. That's why you get, that's why like Wrangler started using a broken, broken twill because they didn't want that skewing effect. And then, you know, just talk about indigo, indigo just a little, just a li little bit. Indigo is quite like remarkable because it comes from a plant, but all the indigo that we use nowadays, 99.9% .9 of all the, all the garments that are made are not made from natural indigo. They're made from a petrol, petrol chemical. And, you know, just like cotton, it's a super thirsty plant. Indigo and, you know, chemical sort of indigo, it comes from, it comes from, poisonous like substances like benzene, like benzene it's made from oil so you know and that has been a big thing recently to try and find a solution not to use chemical indigo obviously natural indigo is amazing but you know and there's lots of cultures and, and countries that still use it if you go to thailand india pakistan anywhere in the east they still use a lot of natural indigo but it's only in a small production you need to have a football field a football field to make a small a small block or small cake and that really isn't sustainable. So the solution is to, to try and go away from chemical indigo and go more to nat into natural. So now an amazing company um, has just come up with a, a new way of making bacteria. So they've actually made a bacteria from natural indigo and they're making it into a more production way. So hopefully in the next few years, we'll be going away more into more of a bacterial uh, indigo base which is going to be amazing amazing and but that natural indigo is amazing you can learn so much from it and the colors from it are unbelievable if any of you get a chance to do any kind of natural indigo workshops do it it's unbelievable I, I flew someone over from mali in africa to do do a natural indigo workshop with with, 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 with us and it was unbelievable the best thing that we ever 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 did and we learned so much about it as well and it's amazing but you know Garments and well, how things are made, it's super, you know, you look at workwear and there's always characteristics that make it work or workwear. This, this particular slide is quite funny. 
because it shows you that if you this thing this particular thing is called a misstitch you might see little mistakes in denim jeans in, and, in, and in workwear these are super important and we as denim designers always try and um, put a tiny mistake in somewhere like sort of like intentionally this is actually done because it's a twin needle like machine and the, the inside like needle is actually stayed, stays in the same place hence where you get that misstitch which is really fun but let's just talk briefly about what a gene is so some people have you know let's just bring everyone up to the same same page so you know on a gene you have a coin pocket you have like rivets you have a safety stitch goes down the side you've got side seams as well you've got a run and fell seams or twisted busted seams in in like middle you've got belt loops back, the back yoke so the back 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 part gives it shape that's your shaped seam um in uh levi's levi's red collection in nine nine ninety nine they put darts in there which is really really fun so you can do many things but you know you've got fly stitches bar tacks front rise back rise these are the main characteristics, but these early details have changed quite, cons quite considerably. Like everything up until the 1920s, it was always morphing and changing. And that's why I always say, looking at this earlier period, even, even between 1876 to 18, 1877, a lot changed. You know, this is the early, another early, like Levi's gene. It's got an early tool pocket for the hammer. It's quite, it's unbelievable, you know. So, a lot changed and obviously when it got finalized roughly in, in like the 20s when it became a lot more mass mass market a lot of these details came off and then as i said the early period is so so fascinating as well this is a gene as well you know and another one that michael allen, allen harrison probably or probably bit brit eaton found but a good gene is um you know you can learn a lot and genes nowadays are they look the same right so everyone every brand looks practically the same so the way that a lot of brands you know keep themselves apart is by either the back pocket stitch or the arcuate or the leather patch or whatever it's like it's like kind of like really kind of like really sort of like really real estate and the best brands and i always tell this to all the all the students that i teach I, I teach a lot in like four different like sort of unis the best pockets are the ones that you don't notice so the the like, the like levi's is the d the, the diesel's lee the wranglers they've achieved it by keeping it really simple the moment you throw on loads of crap you're compensating for some for something else really but then also the yokes as well many people don't know this but a good you know a, a pair of jeans there is a masculine and a feminine way of doing a yoke and levi's do it the mass the mass the mass the masculine way so the body goes over and the yoke goes under but there's brands like edwin lee wrangler some of these brands actually they do it the feminine way and and, and you know i remember um speaking to my creative director at the time at like edwin i worked at, at, at edwin for a short sort of period and I asked him, why is it that we do a feminine yoke? And he goes, oh, because we, we didn't want to copy Levi's, which I thought was a bit silly at, at the time. But anyway, but then you can also coin pockets. This is quite fun. You know, um, a, good, a good denim brand, you know, like everyone always just copies the, the Levi's one, which is amazing. But to be honest, I always tell designers and, and students, just come up with something like creative on the coin pocket. Don't just copy, copy Levi's. Look at, look at Diesel. They came up with doing that angled, angled pocket with their branding on. You know it's a, a diesel gene because that's how it's cut. So it's amazing. So you don't forget about the coin sort of pocket, pocket. Each gene, you might not know, is made with about five or different thicknesses of thread. People just think it's one, like one like thickness. It's really not. There's many different like sort of like thicknesses. And you learn this when you start making products. Because I remember when I made my first ever gene, I was so happy with it, but it, it didn't look right. And the moment you start using thicker stitches in certain, certain, certain areas, it's more freely it brings it brings it to life that goes with the thread thread color as well everyone always seems to think that oh it should be tobacco it should be tobacco actually there's early evidence actually the early jeans weren't tobacco they were using ecru or white color or cream color nowadays like it's known as ecru because all the big the big three use a lot of different shades of like ecru but actually i always whenever i get any kind of fabric i always run loads of colors through it to check which color i actually like it's quite fun and then colors as well nowadays when you make jeans then they're not gonna they're not raw so you can actually now work with ykk and a lot of other trim manner manner factories and design and your own colors and it's quite fun that's something a lot of work that i actually do too the inside of the jeans super important it's kind of like real estate i actually say you can't there's no point um having it blank so just make a rubber stamp stamp it inside I, all the brands that i've worked for i've always filled out the inside of my jeans telling that story is quite important and this is a great, this is um, a, fr a friend of ours called like, Mozzarella, Marcus Morland, ex like, Levi's designer, uh, a, a real amazing uh, a denim, denim designer. He worked at, works at All Saints, works at loads of brands. This is a little brand that he, he did himself. And he made a hundred pairs of jeans with um, 
a company called Warehouse in like Japan, not not Warehouse the, the High Street, Warehouse Japan, an un, un, unbelievable authentic denim brand. But he um, hand branded every single jean. I think it was like 100 pairs made, I believe. And I happen to have a number seven, which I'm so, so thankful that I managed, managed to find. But then the leather patch itself is super important. You know, every brand has one. Now, and a lot of people get, get quite fancy about it and I get, get quite angry when you go, you shouldn't be using leather. You need to be more eco or vegan. Sure. You know, even, even Levi's themselves used a, 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 a like cotton version on their 201 jean, which is their more slightly cheaper like variant. So lots of denim brands do it, but don't forget about the leather patch. Wrangler are amazing because they also feature um, other, other branding around their leather patch which i think is quite like quite like amazing they all uh, they always do it this is a picture of one of the earliest like levi's jeans from their archive this is actually the like nevada jean this particular one is actually made with natural indigo so up until 18 i think it's 1897 it could have been that's when a german scientist actually came up with the chemical version so for the first like 20 or 30 years levi's themselves used natural indigo and they bought their indigo from the Indus Valley region, which is Pakistan. So, you know, so it's quite amazing. There's always um, lots of lots of like discussions where all oh, my gene is 100% made in America or my gene doesn't really happen. You know, all, we, all the components nowadays are shipped from everywhere else. Even like Black Horse Lane in, in like London, they make amazing, amazing, like, amazing products. And I've, I, I, I worked with them for four years. They get all their trims from Turkey. So it's very difficult to get all your components from one area. So it's very hard to do. Of course, you can do it. But um, as I said, this is an early example of an amazing jean made with natural indigo. Again, this one's amazing. It's got one back pocket. It's got the little tool pocket. It's got um, it's got the cinch on, on in, in in between the waistband. Um, unbelievable color and shade, like, superb. But we can't touch it. Talk about jeans without talking about the environmental impact of um, how jeans are made. And this is literally um, happening everywhere. Like everywhere they make make jeans. You know, industry. Um, it's, an, it's environments like this. And I travel, travel quite a lot all around China. Anywhere where they make jeans, I actually go and work. And there's a lot of these things that I see and it's quite sad. And, um, but there's, you know, and every single process that we do, like obviously no one really wears jeans that are raw. And so, um, you know, every, every, every jeans that are practically sold are being rinsed or washed or broken in already. So the stone washing process is quite terrible because it uses obviously pumice stones, but the sludge, from it afterwards, they have to pay a company to take the sludge away. And the sludge, and nothing can grow in, a, grow in a sludge. It's environmental hazards, hazards. So all the areas that they make jeans or they wash jeans, the environment is absolutely sort of terrible, not just for the workers, but for the whole area where the factory is. And then also there's PP spray, um, which is another kind of a bleach, kind of like a potassium permanganate bleach. This is something that's still used. It's not banned yet. And every gene that you would buy most likely has been sprayed with a PP spray. So, um, um, and this is something that's like car or carcinogenic. The guy's wearing a gas mask for God's sake when he's doing it. So it can't be good. And a lot of these things, they're not washed that well. And a lot of these chemicals are still on the genes. It's, it's, it's terrible. But then a lot of the work that I do is I create washing treatments for clients. So how do I do that in a more sustainable way? So in the last few years, I've been working a lot with um, a lot of amazing companies uh, one in particular called like te sort of like Tencel and um, doing a lot of stuff with like sort of like sort of the Gene Logia and lots of got some great companies like sort of like Tornello. There's loads of companies that are trying to do washing treatments in a more sustainable way because people still want wash jeans. That, that's the problem. And the process of how you wash jeans is still not that good. So what are the solutions here? What are the ways of making jeans that are more better? And you know, um, it's lots of terrible things. This is enzyme, enzyme washing. This is actually something that's considered a bit more environmentally friendly, but you know, is it really? It's still a lot of chemicals. It, it, it makes it soft. You get a lot of clients like sort of Tesco's and Primark, a lot of enzyme here and, and like tinting as well. I create a lot of 3D treatments as well. I, I do do a lot of things by hand, a bit like in like woodwork class. I look at real garments and I look at how the wear patterns are. But then, you know, what's amazing, what's happening is also is, um, um, there's companies now that are creating laser patterns and they're creating more sustainable finishes. Hopefully I'll put the slide in this present, present, presentation, but it's amazing that you can create all these treatments by using just a glass of water, not just, you know, not just 20,000 or two, it's like 2000 gallons or so to, to wash. It's insane, insane amount of water is used to actually wash jeans as well. But 
one of the main problems that people don't talk about is polyester. Now, most jeans that you guys wear, and this is not just jeans, this is sportswear as well, is made from polyester. And polyester is the new evil, the new cancer that we're, we're just touching on now. And this is a polyester a microfiber that they found and this is they found polyester in like mushrooms it's, it's airborne you know every single person every single person living has a credit size as a credit card size amount of plastic inside in inside them all the fish that we eat has polyester in it it's insane so you know and you know there should be a tag like this on every single garment you know, warning this garment contains a hundred 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 percent poly, polyester fiber which is a crude which is a like derivative of crude oil sh sheds microplastic when like, machine washed is harmful when swallowed. Of course, no one's going to put this tag on it, but it should 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 actually be there. But what are the alternatives? Obviously, we we got touched on like Tencel. Tencel are amazing. They get um, a company that make lots of different fibers, but um, actually the parent company like sort of like, sort of like lensing does. But Tencel or like or like Lysel is superb. Um, there's companies like uh, Candiani Denim who've just made. They're like ITMA awarded fabric. It's got them, you know, every five years they have this um, show and they, they basically made a fabric um, that had 10, 10, 10 cell like, like Lysol in it. It's the most advanced fabric that's ever been made. It was made with 10 cell. Not, you're not using any virgin cotton at all. We get hibiscus, we have fair feathers, we have silk, we have hemp. Hemp has come a long way as well. In, since the 80s, um, up until the 80s, Hemp was, everyone regarded it kind of like linen. It was very difficult to spin, but now they come up with a new, um, um, a new cottonized hemp since the 80s. And that's now it's become a lot more fashionable. A lot more people are jumping on hemp. They're realizing you don't need as, as much water to grow it. It's super good for the environment. It's got anti-bacterial properties. And it kind of looks like the old way, old kind of hemp, old kind of cotton, really slubby and really authentic. So hemp's, hemp's, like, a, hemp's, like, an, hemp's like another one to actually watch. These are the two companies, and there's many more that are doing wonders in the denim world. We've got our friends like sort of in like, Italy called like Tornello and in, and in Spain like Gilogia. Like they 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 both they're competitors, but they're friends. I, I'm I'm friends with both of them. But basically, um, Tornello are known for their like machines and their big machines. But now they also do lay, laser too, and and like Gilogia also are known for the laser machines and and all of their advancements. But now they're also known for their eco washers as well. So they two competitors both doing amazing things if you ever go if you ever buy your jeans and they've been sustainably watched most likely it's been done by one of two of these companies or or, or, or their machines so it's quite, quite amazing and there's also other chemical companies as well so like all the different dyes and there's no now aniline free there's so many other people but these are the two that are are very 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 important um laser finishing i was nearly touched on it so back in um 2002 i was one of the first designers back um, to work with a laser machine. This is for Levi's like Japan. This is when Levi's Europe and America weren't that interested in using laser at that time. It was very, very expensive. And it's only Levi's Japan were very keen on it. I happened to be working at Okini at the time as a, a London based like, collective and they were up for it. They said, yeah, let's do it. So we did our first laser collection with like, Le 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 Levi's Japan. And we sent these garments off to the Levi's archive as well. So they got, they got pieces of all of these. Not many of them were made, only about, about, about 100 or so. And that's kind of me and my presentation. Obviously, you can follow me on Mawson Sajid, um, um, at Endrime and at Denim History, my educational work, and 74 MMA. So let's just see. Let me stop sharing now. Let's see if there's been any chats, any questions. Let's see if we have a chance, please. Oh, uh, dude, you know, we can't, we can't even talk about this. We can't even, we can't even say... Um, we, this event wouldn't have been happening if it wasn't for our friends at, at like ISCO and ISCO are amazing. Actually, they, they helped me at the very beginning of my career. I've been using their fabrics for ages, but they also help sponsor a lot of the educational work that we actually do. They have their own eye school as well. They're at the forefront of, of, of education, which is amazing. But, you know, there's, amazing, there's such amazing denim brands and denim companies, but they're one of the more sustainably led ones as well. Have any of you guys got any questions? Or Tamsin, do you want to jump in and ask me any questions in the last like 10 minutes or oh, we've got some questions here are you optimistic about the innovation of sustainable denim oh man you know i've become a much more better designer since i've been using tensile isl and thinking more sustainably like i i hold my hand up in here i was using every worst chemical there was you know i've been a denim designer for nearly 20 years in the last three or four years i've been now pushing myself and and it's become a new way of designing really it's like a race to make the most sustainable gene and it's really fun to a point where it's like you know using like literally half a glass of water to make an entire gene um 
unbelievable and that's that's what's that's that's what's cool and every few months even that there's loads of events from kingpins to denim pv there's loads of big trade shows i go to all of the like sustainable talks and you've got to be to be to be an educator of denim and the denim design you need to know what's going on but all of these mills all the chemical companies they're all doing amazing things it's just all up to the buyers of these companies and the and the, and the actual designers to make sure make sure that they use some of these technologies when they're when they're designing so yeah tamsin have you got any sort of questions yeah, no i would i love the bit where you were talking about mining denim yeah. we have a hashtag at fashion revolution which is uh, love clothes last yeah and that seemed to be just you know the absolute pinnacle of uh um, you know, will stand you know, being, the test of time i've learned so much about vintage garments you know it's like you more, I've learned more from, I went to um, a, a, a like recycling plant in Pakistan, maybe about two or three months ago before COVID. And I was picking up vintage garments that were from the thirties that they were about to shred to make cotton for, make recycled cotton. So I learned so much about vintage garments and about how things are washed and about thread colors. And it's really amazing. Of course, buying vintage and buying like recycled is super important now. Like, you know, I don't remember the last time I actually bought anything. That's the honest truth. So yeah, buy, 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 buy old stuff, learn from it design new stuff, do it in a more sustainable way, work with cool mills, and yeah, try your, yeah, anyway, but yeah. I have a question, Mason. that was really good, by the way, really. Oh, yeah, you know, it's only a snapshot, you know, I do seven hour versions of this presentation, seven hours. Amazing. Yeah, you know, it's, it's um, and I do them at like, colleges from LCF to RCA to everywhere, and you know, it's really quite fun, but I'm, Look, I'm very happy. As as someone who's not a denim expert myself at all, I learned loads. That was great. Oh, Thank that's you. Good. That's good. Um, one thing I found quite interesting was you were talking about the cotton plant and how it's been genetically modified so much over yeah. the years, and that some people are trying to get back to that original strain yeah, of cotton. Yeah. How, do, how, do, how do they do that? Basically, you know, actually, it's, it's, it's an interesting story. So, in like America, they had um, an LS cotton. Their cotton is quite short, staple. And what they did is they actually genetically modified it with an Egyptian cotton and they called it a uh, Supima cotton or superior cotton. It's quite an American story really. But um, it's always been there. People have been genetically mod modifying things to get the best yield out of it. Obviously the cotton that we grow now, um, especially the one that BCI and his company, his companies, they're happy about because it doesn't use much water. You know, they you control it a lot, a lot, a lot more. So that's why they did it because the yields were really strange. So they had to genetically modify it to come to a strain that was it could work in Pakistan, it could work anywhere, and you know, the rest of it. But um, the race to, to always find a more authentic cotton has happened only since the 90s. You know, up until the 90s, um, we, us in the West, didn't really care. We were happy with the open end stuff. Was, um, you know, we were quite happy. We didn't even know. It was only our, Jap our Japanese friends when they started, when they started to make denim in like the early 90s, and they went to America, they went to Cone and lots of factories, and they said, hey, can we buy this old denim? And, and they go, we don't, don't even have the looms. We don't even have the cotton anymore to do it. So the Japanese were the ones that have been just, uh, they're a bit like with their music and fashion, everything, they, they're yeah. passionate and they learn about it and they educated the world really about what good denim is. So um, yeah, the race is always trying to find that slubby denim, but then how to make a denim, you know, most people don't like slubby fabrics. They like things that are silky and smooth. So mm. there's room also for silk denim. There's room, you know, hence why, why, why Tencel was there. It's very, uh, uh, luxurious but now Tencel and, and those companies they're trying to make denim their own denim lines more slubbier and more authentic so um yeah. there's not everyone wants to wear something that's super still super sticky so it's going more authentic but yeah it's, it's a race now to make the most sustainable gene but everyone's doing it so we're, we're all winning really because every couple of months there's a new innovation from foam yeah. dyeing to everything so it's amazing Martin, we have a couple of questions um, from our viewers on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, Brian E. Strange is asking, can you recommend any hidden gems in UK or Europe to find vintage denim pieces? We want to know your secrets. <laughs> okay, there's a couple of cool people in like Europe. There's a, there's a French dude called Brut Archive. He's in Paris, an amazing vintage like collector. Of course, obviously you have the vin, vin, vintage showroom in, in, like the, in like the UK. Um, there's a, a couple of amazing shops in Where's London. Where's the vintage showroom in UK? Vintage showroom. They got. I got a shop in in Carnaby. Um, it's already in like sort of Covent Garden. They have a showroom as well in West Sussex that you can visit. Um, it's all in like East London as well. Sorry, West London. Sorry, my wife's actually corrected or correcting me. Okay. Um, but there's many more. And to be honest, you know, even um, there's so Instagram's superb. You know, so it's a point you just 
literally hashtag vintage denim or, or denim history or whatever, you get so much that pops up. And, and I've made so many friends in the US and there's loads of artists and designers just like me. And we're all very friendly and we share our, machi our like machine like knowledge. And I said, mm -hmm. you can't be a denim designer without knowing your machines or knowing how to pattern cut and, you know, okay. it's one of the benefits of coming from a British school. I, I learned yeah. so much. You, you meet all these other designers and they just concentrated on making shirts or jersey their whole, their whole entire career. And I'm like, dude, you should have just been multitasking the whole time. But, um, uh, we'd also like some advice, Morsin, yeah. on shopping for sustainable denim, especially on a budget. On a budget. <laughs> okay. Um, it depends what your budget is. You know, if you the thing is some of these sustainable practices, you know, if you get a gene that's been sustainably washed on a, on a gene logger or like, or like Tornello machine or, or it's been ozone finished, it's still not pricey, but it can be. That's why you get some denim jeans that are 200 pounds, 180. That's kind of the price. Yes, you can get it. I, I know some of the high, some of the high street are opting, are, are doing a lot of these things as things as well. I don't know. There is a lot of brands in like the US, a lot more, a lot more of the LA brands that have actually been consciously and, and telling people about what they're doing in the UK in Europe. We don't often know how the gene has been finished. You know, and I'm sure a lot of the Who stuff in is, LA? Who? Can in you LA, um, is, um, is a brand called Ty is it Tri 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 Triarchy tri Sard is another one. Um, Boyish is another brand which is quite amazing. Yeah, yeah. DL 1969. My wife's actually helping me here. There's a there's many that are all doing it, and the thing is, it's the ones that are talking about it. Isn't as a, as a um, you know, and there's, an, there's, a, there's another one, there's an Australian brand called Outland Outland Denim, which my, my friend Claire did, like sort of like sort of like designs for, and there's a lot of artisan brands, younger brands that are opting these technologies first. And you'll see in the high street, soon there will be tags saying it's been ozone finished or it's been done on a laser machine. No water has touched this garment. And even, even to the fact where it's going to be blockchain. So when you buy a garment, we'll have a tag on it and you'll be able to find out where the cotton came from and how mm. far away it, where it was spun and how far away it was made. These technologies are all there. And a lot of these bigger brands are starting to adopt them. Even when I was at VF and I was at Timberland, there was already a barcode system in place where you can actually find out where your, your garment was actually made. That was VF eight years ago, whatever it was. So, do, you, yeah. do you think um, that the price tag of a pair of jeans has been skewed by some brands who are selling them incredibly cheaply? Have we, have we yeah. lost? track of what a pair of jeans should completely you know cost. in itself is is very it should be considered premium and it's not you know the fact that i go to pakistan or bangladesh only these developing countries and I'm, i shake hands with another cotton guy or go oh i've got a new mill and i'm like oh dude why are you why are you another guy making cotton you know it's just it's um thing is it, it should be as a premium product we actually sell our jeans at, at a loss to be honest all these mills that make it it, it should be teams as a premium product you know i've always said that High Street shouldn't have been allowed to um, sell jeans. They shouldn't be allowed to use virgin cotton at all. It should be banned for them. They should only be using recycled. This is High Street. So people like Primark and those companies out overnight would not be allowed to use virgin cotton. So that's only a good thing. But that kind of like uh, legislation is not going to ever happen. So because there's too much money involved, governments get money from all the all the duties. It's all a bit murky. But okay. um, but yeah. Wilson, we're going to have to wrap up there i can't bear it but i'm sure everybody can oh everybody can get in touch with you uh, via your instagram handle yeah. instagram I'm, I'm at denim history i'm at morsin sarjid um enzyme as well i have a couple of different ones and uh, but, but denim history one's my education one um i teach a lot of the rca i'm doing a phd course quite soon with lots of people so in, in the world of denim education and we can't mention you know, our friends like, like sort of the kingpins and like sort of like transformers like foundation and like lensing there's loads of amazing companies that are supporting fashion students including isco including loads of people so it's really amazing that the mills and everyone are supporting but thank you so much for involving me and thank you so much for let, letting me open your of your week i was very oh, thank you Marson. thank you for showing you, us an amazing collection it was fascinating and uh, we're going to wrap up this session now. I just want to give a massive big thank you to Isco Denim yep. uh, for making today possible. You'll be able to see Mawson later on at four o'clock. He'll be joining us for a panel discussion where we're going to be talking more about the future of denim. Um, so come back and you'll be able to see him then. Uh, and yeah.
Thank you very much, everybody, for joining. Thank you so much, guys. Cheers. Um,